This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. The Illinois Central Railroad connected Galena and Chicago to Cairo, Illinois in 1856. At that time, it was the longest railroad in the entire world. During its construction, the railroad hired attorney Abraham Lincoln to represent them. Trains still run through much of the original routes, and you can see the track and depots in the small towns between Chicago and Cairo. Here you can see the track running between Oak and Chestnut Streets in Monee, a village on the edge of the Chicago suburbs, and the track running between Oak and Chestnut in Loda, and the track running between Oak and Chestnut in Pesotum, and Nioga, and Farina, and Richview, and DeSoto, and you get the point. All of these towns were designed with the exact same grids and even the exact same street names. In fact, here's the original template for new cities built along the Illinois Central Railroad. All you had to do was fill in the blank for the town name, stake out the streets, and build the railroad. You'd have yourself a new town. A total of 33 towns in Illinois share the exact same original plat map. The towns of the Illinois Central Railroad are just one example of the mass production of new towns along railroad routes. This was done along the tracks all over the western United States. Why would railroads need to found cities like this, and how were they designed? Let's get into it after the bike bell. The Illinois Central Town Planning Scheme was a useful blueprint for future railroad companies, a blueprint that was especially useful once transcontinental railroads were being built across the West. Transcontinental railroads were costly, risky endeavors, and the U.S. government gave railroads land grants to make it worth their while. The land meant the railroads owned the land underneath the rails, but also land along the route too. In the eastern part of the country, railroads primarily connected existing cities to strengthen the ties of their local economies. In the western part of the country, there were very few towns to connect. Those that did exist aggressively lobbied railroads to route their tracks nearby to reap the economic benefits. A railroad depot would serve as a hub for local agriculture. They would get grain silos, local marketplaces, and the other benefits associated with the connection between the local economy and the larger national one. One study examined the disappearance of post offices along railroad routes. Now, why is this relevant? Because back in the 1800s, any town with a few buildings around an intersection could apply for a post office and be granted one by the federal government. It was super easy. This means that there were small towns all over the West with post offices that make for great data points. The researchers found that post offices and thereby towns located between 5 and 10 kilometers from a railroad were 20 to 50% less likely to survive to 2010 than post offices over 50 kilometers from the railroad. The railroads clearly helped the cities they connected, but cities they bypassed, those near-miss cities, suffered because they couldn't compete with the nearby railroad towns. Other, more isolated cities were not in direct competition with railroad depots and survived. Railroads had some incentive to connect existing cities filled with customers ready to ride the rails. The bribe cities gave to attract the railroads didn't hurt either. But railroads can make a lot more money by platting their own cities and selling the lots. They also designed cities to play a little defense. The federal land grants were typically given in a checkerboard pattern, so the railroad would own every odd-numbered square mile in a township along the tracks. There wasn't anything stopping the federal government from selling a square mile along the tracks to a separate private investor who wanted to set up a town. So the railroad built towns by the dozen to crowd out private speculators as much as they could. The new towns existed only on paper until settlers arrived and found tanneries, saloons, barbershops, laundries, and all the other essential businesses needed to run a town. The railroads hoped to jumpstart the local economy by attracting as many settlers and proprietors as possible. Railroads purposely kept business lots small to encourage many individual business owners to arrive instead of one large general store owner. There is no doubt that many Eastern residents, as well as recent immigrants to the United States, saw these Western towns as a real opportunity to own land and get in on the ground floor of a great real estate investment. Railroad town promoters would use sales pitches like, imagine if you had been there to purchase a plum lot along Michigan Avenue in Chicago. You'd be rich today. Townsite promoters even made their plat maps boastful and used them as marketing tools. The plan for Natrona, Illinois had named streets between I and P streets south to north, and 11th to 16th streets east to west. The map heavily implied that Natrona would soon grow much larger than its platted borders and would soon need new streets on all sides to accommodate the growth. The reality was something else entirely. Natrona didn't turn out great or at all really, but what were the rest of these cookie cutter cities like? Railroad towns were designed to sell as many lots as possible as fast as possible. Uniformity and clarity were key. Creativity didn't factor in at all. The plat or map of the new city designed to sell lots was used as a promotional tool, and the town design itself was meant to be easy to decipher. Lots that were 50 feet wide were residential lots for houses. 
25 foot lots were meant for businesses. Main streets were between 80 and 100 feet wide, while residential streets were only 60 feet wide. Just by looking at the plat, a potential buyer could tell exactly where the main streets would be, where the residential neighborhoods were, and where the railroad would be located. One wouldn't even need to visit the city to choose a lot. If you wanted to set up your barbershop, you would know that the corner of 1st Avenue and Main Street was probably your best bet. The standard railroad plat varied by company and through time. The symmetric layout of the Illinois central towns, with the railroad cutting straight through the center, was the first popular form. Cheyenne and Laramie, Wyoming, and Modesto and Fresno in California are examples of this symmetric town plat. The next basic plat style had Main Street running perpendicular to the tracks. This way, businesses would still be close, but the tracks wouldn't split downtown in half. Cities along the Santa Fe Railroad in Kansas, for example, used it frequently. You can see how much each town along the line used a very similar plan over and over and over again. Finally, railroad companies moved to a plan that resembled a T-shape, with the railroad tracks at the edge of town and Main Street running perpendicular through the center. This design minimized the disruption to local traffic from the railroads and spared more residents from the noise pollution. Yet Main Street was still readily accessible to the station. You can see this play out in a later route installed by the Illinois Central Railroad through Iowa. They platted 80 cities in the state along the line, all with a T-shape that is still recognizable in many today. Railroads constructed these towns in a similarly mass-produced way. Luckily, by definition, all of these towns had great railroad access. Here's an account of how one town was built. A long freight train arrived, laden with frame houses, boards, furnitures, palings, old tents, and all the rubbish that makes up one of these mushroom cities. The guard jumped off his van and seeing some friends on the platform, called out with a flourish, Gentlemen, here's Julesburg. Railroad town planning was sort of a numbers game. Most of them didn't turn out to be anything but small towns dotting the prairies along the American West, but a few of them did become the kind of thriving metropolises their promoters sold to unwitting settlers. Sacramento, the western terminus of the first transcontinental railroad, prospered. LA wouldn't be LA without the railroads. Kansas City, Omaha, St. Louis, Las Vegas, Albuquerque, Portland, and Tacoma are all well-known cities either platted by railroads or thrived because the railroads chose them as depots over neighboring towns. As much as I'm happy that these places exist, I mean, I lived in Sacramento for seven years and it will always have a special place in my heart, I can't say the railroad town phenomena was a positive one. For starters, they created incredibly boring cities. There was little regard for the surrounding environment or anything to differentiate between one town from the other a few miles down the tracks. The towns were designed for the railroad first and people second. They were also designed to transform land into a commodity that could be easily delineated and sold. They were mass-producing cities and lots. When you consider that they were doing it over land historically inhabited by native people, it's pretty clear that railroad towns are one of the most egregious examples of settler colonialism, manifest destiny, and capitalism run amok. Now there's one aspect of railroad towns I didn't get into. What they were like after they were built. Are they anything like westerns in movies with swinging saloon doors and horses hitched to posts and that sort of thing? I've uploaded an extended version of this video that discusses that over on Nebula. That content actually replaces this ad because there aren't any ads on Nebula. We're calling this bonus extended content Nebula Plus, and you'll see a lot of that over there, and not just for me, all sorts of creators uploading Nebula Plus content. Nebula is where I post additional content on videos and Nebula original videos, like my most recent original video, The Best Cities 2020 Awards, where I determine which city implemented the most cutting edge urban policy for the year. Will the winner be Portland, Beijing, Paris, or Nairobi? You have to watch on Nebula to find out. Nebula is great, and it's made even better thanks to our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the source for high-quality, engaging documentaries. They have railroad content to continue your learning on this topic. They have a great video on the Transcontinental Railroad hosted by Peter Sagal, host of NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. It's worth a watch. We have a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link below, you'll get Nebula for free. That's not a free trial, but free as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And they're running a special deal where you can get your entire year for 26% off. That's less than $15 for a year of CuriosityStream and Nebula. Signing up is a great way of supporting this channel, as well as the dozens of other creators working to make Nebula a success. It's overall just a really good deal too. So go click on the link in the description and get 26% off.